Gleiche bis Young Lady. Uh, and my emotional partner, as they say. When Pastor Petronila and uh, uh, family were well, here, I remember this, 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 this week we are starting, is, it's, is it your wedding anniversary? I think you got married uh, this time. She's, she, 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 she also, she's also doing, she's, she's also doing um, several years. I think we are following very closely. We will catch up at some point. So, uh, good morning and praise the Lord. Amen. Yeah, it's great to see everybody. And it's wonderful to, to stand here and to see all the wonderful people. Um, and we thank God for giving us again this opportunity that we may share in his word. And um, thank the, pastor, the pastoral team also for, um, for risking the pulpit for, <laughs> for strangers. Okay. <laughs> and we do trust that God is going to, uh, to remind us. Today we are considering the topic of giving and looking at this topic, I think it's a continuation of what Pastor uh, Reverend Kiprop shared last week about Thanksgiving, because they do go hand in hand. And so we will uh, remind ourselves on what the Bible says about giving, especially sacrificial giving. Um, issues of giving are extremely sensitive. In fact, uh, uh, the reason is because it has been misused in many quarters. If you like watching television or YouTube where people are being asked to give, you see there's a lot of drama, right? There's a lot of um, activities that really border on witchcraft, that border on, uh, on, 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 on betting. I think there is spiritual betting that if you give this, you will get this. Unfortunately, a lot of people subscribe to it. And, um, and so I think within CITAM, we really don't want to speak very loudly about it, simply because um, it has been misused out there. Unfortunately, when you avoid speaking about it, you miss out a lot on God's blessings that come with being a giver. It has been said that Jesus spoke about giving, stewardship, tithing, and all those, more than he spoke about prayer and fasting and uh, everything else that we think about. So it certainly is an important aspect of our Christian living. And so we will begin by uh, reading this scripture that is common, I think. Second Corinthians 8, verse 1 to 12. And if you have your Bibles, or you can follow on the screen. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. So we urged Titus, just as he had earlier made a, be a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. We jump to verse 12, which says that for if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. Okay? And as they say, that is the reading of the word. And then it yeah, 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 yeah. I know you came from places where um, the reading of the word was serious. First reading, 
second reading, others had third reading. Eh? And I, I think it was good. The Bible says, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture. So they were practicing that. Now, I like this story of somebody who holds the record of the world's greatest miser. It was a lady. <laughs> and her name was Hetty Green, who lived between 1834 and 1960. She was an American businesswoman and a, and a financier. A financier in the sense that her county government would borrow money from her to run the government, okay? Yes, and uh, 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 so, so she was named by the Guinness Book of World Records as the greatest miser. I think she still has this record. Despite her wealth, she was a renowned cheapskate, okay? She didn't live in a house that she owned. She spent her life after as her husband died living in boarding houses. And in fact, it said that when she was getting married, because her husband had less resources than, than her, she had to write a prenuptial agreement so that she can define her territory that her husband could not uh, interfere, okay? She owned a single black dress that she wore every day. She asked her cleaning woman to only wash the dirty parts to save money on soap, okay? <laughs> she didn't have an office. She used a room at the bank where she held much of her money. She only ate oatmeal, which was heated on the radiator at the bank. She personally never used heat or hot water as it cost too much money. She once spent an entire evening trying to find a two cent stamp that she lost. A stamp is uh, basically a voucher to allow poor people to access free services. Free food, you can have a, f a food stamp a stamp that you can redeem in a supermarket, um, okay? When her son was injured, she took him to a free clinic for the poor, waiting days to get him admitted. That delay eventually resulted in, in him losing his leg. Estimates of her net worth at death range from 100 million to 200 million dollars, which is equivalent to 2.49 billion to 4.98 billion in 2022. And it's not Kenyan shillings, it's what? USD. If you multiply that by 120, it is one that would make the Kenyan government salivate, right? <laughs> I'm sure you are thinking, I know somebody like that, right? You know, we used to be told that there were some rich men who would collapse of hunger, yet they had thousands of money in their pockets because they were not keen on spending that money, okay? And that is a... a well, world record, but probably not a good one to have. Now, contrast it with the story of Bob. Bob Pierce was a Baptist evangelist and a missionary relief worker who was in China during the Chinese Civil War. Remember, there was a Chinese Civil War in the uh, 1940s. On one of his missionary trips, he met a missionary teacher and gave her his last $5 to care for an abandoned child. And he promised to send the same amount every month. And he kept sending uh, that money when he get, got back. Three years later, moved by this experience, he founded the World Vision. And then went on to found the Samaritan's Pass in 1970. Now, I'm sure some of you know the World Vision. Some of you have been employed there, have felt their impact. You know, if you come from uh, the arid and semi-arid areas. Uh, and that started from a generous gift of $5 by somebody whose heart was touched. And, and the Samaritan Pass, you know, the president of Samaritan Pass is, uh, is, 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 is I think, uh, uh, Franklin Graham, yeah? The, the, the son of Billy Graham, who took over after Bob, after Bob died. And so we still feel the impact today, but we don't remember the other lady. I'm sure some of you may never have heard. Let's go to Google and Google the, 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 there's a lot of stories about her story that makes it fascinated. But Bob, Bob had this to say, we serve everyone, we want to be in the world. What we think Jesus Christ would be if he were in the middle of all these problems and needs. And um, one of the powerful statements attributed to him is that, let my heart be broken by the things that break the heart of God. That is, I think that's a, a good personal statement that somebody can have. Great, so when we talk about giving, I'd like us to consider uh, three or four things. And the first thing is the fact that stewardship is a basis 
for all giving, okay? All generosity is hinged on the concept of stewardship. When we are talking about stewardship, the question really is, who is the owner? Who is the boss, okay? Psalm 24 verse one makes it very clear. The earth is the Lord's and all that it contains and the world and those who dwell in it. Psalm 89, 11, the heavens are yours, the earth is also yours. The world and all that it contains, you have founded them. So there is no question about who the boss here is, who is the source. In fact, not just the things that exist, but even the dwellers, including you. So you don't belong to you, <laughs> you belong to somebody. The owner is somebody. And so this somebody is our ultimate source, God himself. And God being the source allows us resources on our way. So the source allows you to be in a job. And the job provides for your daily needs. He allows you to be in business. He allows you to be a farmer. He allows you to do A, B, C, and D as the source. The problem is when we assume that the resource is the source. And when the resource is the source, or we imagine that the resource is the source, it clouds the concept of stewardship in the biblical sense. So you are a steward, and sometimes we confuse, we confuse what we have as if we own. You may have it, but you don't own it. You may have it, but you don't own it. Do you have a piece of soil somewhere called land? You really don't own it. First of all, you even took it from somebody. And that it will also be taken by somebody else. So how, how can you say it's yours? It's not, <laughs> it's not yours. Even the health that you have, right? Somebody, you're healthy today, tomorrow you don't. So is, can you, do you really have it? Do you really own it? You have it for now. Steward it nicely, doing the things that can be done. Because something can happen, a court order can come, and what you thought was yours is gone. And if that was your anchor, then things become extremely difficult. So if you are a steward, then a steward manages according to the intention and the vision of the owner. You see, if you have a farm and you have planted your vegetables and things, and you have a farm worker who helps you, and you go and say, I need some vegetables to eat, and he says, no, you are not stepping here. What will you do? You'll fire him, right? Yes. <laughs> so what is the perspective of a steward? A steward holds staff loosely. When we don't have the stewardship mindset, we believe that what we have is ours, and so we are welded to it. When you hold it loosely, you know that the command center, the ultimate source, can command what you are holding in a given direction. And your work is to obey, right? You said you are the farm worker. The owner of the farm can give orders. And in fact, there are people who not only hold staff, the staff hold them, right? The staff hold them. So stewardship, he is the source. The second thing is that giving is God's nature. Being after God's nature, part of it is being a giver. Romans 8, 32, he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? He is a giver by nature. The very famous John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. His most precious gift to us was his son. If you're asked to give you your son or your daughter, most likely, in fact, somebody was saying, if I'm asked to give my son I will negotiate so that I give my spouse instead. Second <laughs> um, Peter 1 verse 3, his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Everything we need for life and godliness. And sometimes we think that God gives us things and he doesn't want us to be happy. But 1 Timothy 6, 17 says he richly provides all things for us to do what? To enjoy. We are supposed to enjoy. It's God's plan that we enjoy as stewards. You are a steward, you, as a channel, right? As a channel, but you're also enjoying that which he has 
given you. So giving is God's nature. Thirdly, you and I are selfish by nature. Okay? That's why sacrificial giving is not easy. Our DNA is a DNA of selfishness listed among the acts of the flesh in Galatians because it challenges our selfishness. And you know, nobody is taught to be selfish, right? When children are born, you know the way they are selfish, eh? It's mine. You give them a toy and it's mine, right? You give them a suite of one shilling, two, two sweets, and you ask for one, will they give you? Most likely they will hold it and say, no, 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 this, this is mine. They don't know that you can buy 1,000 of them and eat if you wanted. And that you can even withdraw that privilege from them. That is, the, so that, that is really our nature as, as, as human beings. And we, I was thinking, you know, we, we remain children of God even when you are old, like Francis, the golden age. We, we, don't, we don't at some point become adults of God, right? Always children of God. Because we are hiding stuff from him even when we are 70. <laughs> God is giving us things and saying, okay, give me one. And it's like, no, 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 this is mine. You will not have it. Okay, adults of God, children of God, sorry. And I guess with some rebellion, we can also become teenagers of God, but still children. But we remain children of God, right? <laughs> Great. And again, this is Pastor Kiprop Salmon, that a generous heart comes from a grateful heart. Generosity is a sign of gratefulness. In fact, somebody said, you know, and, and, and love, somebody says generosity is spelled as L-O-V-E. That's the spelling of generosity, okay? It's spelled as L-O-V-E. I found this scripture about, um, about um, um, the Lazarus and, and, he, and, and the resurrection of, Lazar, uh, of Lazarus uh, intriguing. Recorded in John chapter 12. Remember in, 11, in chapter 11, Lazarus had died and there was all this commotion and Jesus comes and resurrects him. And six days before the Passover, um, that's John, John chapter 12 from verse 1, Jesus came to Bethany, the hometown of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. Okay? So they hosted a dinner for Jesus there. Martha served and Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took a, about a pinter of expensive perfume made of pure nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet and wiped them with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of perfume. You know, people have given various reasons as to why Mary was doing this act of breaking the alabaster jar full of extremely expensive oil. People have valued it as several years of wages for an individual. And, um, but if you read carefully about this story, you will realize that Mary Magdalene, Mary was, the, of course, the sister to Lazarus and also her mother. When Jesus wept, you know that verse of Jesus wept? Yeah. Why did Jesus weep? It's because she saw Mary weeping. Martha had already finished with Jesus and said, oh, you should have, if you are here, she would not have, you would not have died. And Jesus said, no, I can resurrect again. And Martha was like, yeah, I know, you will resurrect in the last day. And then Mary comes to the scene and she falls down on Jesus' feet and she starts weeping. And uh, Jesus was moved by the weeping of Mary and the people that were around her. And then Jesus himself wept, okay? Um, Mary was like, you know, mother was behaving like the African man who are not supposed to cry. Now, six days later, Mary looks at the brother. I think Lazarus and Mary was, were closer <laughs> than Lazarus and Martha. And what she's seeing is the dead man, the man who was the formerly dead man, is reclining at the table with Jesus. And remembering that this guy had died, he was very grateful. And he's like, you know what? What is the best I can give here? And she goes to the family treasury and removes the, this jar that even goes to Judas to complain that this thing should have been sold to the poor, right? Why are you doing this? Of course, because he was a thief. Remember later on, Judas himself sold Jesus, right? For 30 bob, 30 pieces of silver, sorry. Uh, and, and, and he was basically 
pretending that he, he was caring for the poor. So it was the gratefulness of Mary seeing a brother who was dead. I know some of us have lost relatives. And if you see your relative who had been lost sitting and reclining at the table with their master, I'm sure you'll be extremely grateful. And this was the attitude. It was a generous heart that came from a grateful heart, heart, a heart that was grateful because of a serious miracle that had happened to a friend, to a brother. And in fact, if you read clearly, this, this, this feast was happening in the house of Simon the leper, right? The fact that they were meeting in Simon's house who was a leper and lepers were supposed to be quarantined means that Simon had also been healed, right? So this was a, a thanksgiving for people who had received healing. And if somebody had been healed from leprosy, but this other guy had been healed from, from the very death. <laughs> Only that we have also had our Lazarus moments. Do you remember Ephesians 2? As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and your sins, which you used to live when you followed the ways of, the, of this world. Verse 5 says, he made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgression. So we have also been resurrected the Lazarus way, okay? Spiritually dead, Lazarus way. Spiritually resurrected, the Lazarus way. And uh, Lazarus was reclining with Jesus on the table. Where are we reclining ourselves? Verse 6, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. You see where we are reclining? In the heavenly realms with who? With Christ Jesus. Is that a reason to be thankful? Our gratefulness and our generosity should stem from the fact that we were previously dead. You are a former dead person. Now you are alive. And being thankful for what the resurrector has done should move us towards a generous heart and a generous giving. Somebody has said that the, attitude, the, the, the good Samaritan story summarizes the attitudes of stewardship, okay? And uh, of course, we won't read that scripture. In this story, we find several characters. The first character, of course, is the priest and the Levite who passed by this injured guy. And so what is the attitude? What is mine is mine. I will keep it. I cannot use my treasure for this guy here. I don't have the time. I don't have my talent. Maybe they had a first aid talent. They should at least know that there is a way of, uh, of, of supporting somebody. Okay, the priest and the Levite attitude is, what is mine is mine. I will keep it. That is probably the attitude of many Christians. What is mine is mine. If God asked for it, the Peter took handle. Then of course you have the thieves, okay? The thieves who had had a fellowship with this guy, uh, not in a very good way. And what is the thief saying? What is yours is mine. I will have it. What is yours is mine. I will get it, give it to me. Then you have the good Samaritan. What is mine is yours. You can have it, okay? I'll take you to the inn, I'll deposit the money. It's all mine, but it is yours because I'm a good Samaritan. But the Christian attitude then should be a little closer to the Samaritan is that what is mine is God's. It is his, he will decide what to do with it. I'm sure you, which is the list that you would like to meet in this, in this, in this list? The, the scenario that you would least want to encounter. I'm sure none of us would like to encounter the thief, right? Who says, what is yours is mine, I will get it. And they take it away from me. Unfortunately, that is the attitude we have towards God. That when God says bring, you're like, no, 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 what is yours? Okay, it, we know that it's, it belongs to God. We have settled it. God, what is yours is mine. I'm not bringing. <laughs> uh, so, so that is a robber. That's the term of a? Yeah, of a robber. Some, some, some few examples in the scripture. There's a story of Solomon that is extremely, of course, we do know that it's a, it's a, it's a common story. We know uh, what did happen to Solomon. First Kings chapter, uh, chapter 3, verse 4. The king went to Gibeon to offer sacrifices, for that was the most important high place, and Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on the altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream and said, ask for whatever you want me to give you. And we know that Solomon asked for wisdom, and he was told that because you have asked for wisdom, I'll also give you wealth and riches and everything. What might escape 
our mind is the type of sacrifice that Solomon offered to trigger a visitation by God. And to understand the type of sacrifice, we need to know the prescription for a burnt offerings in the book of Leviticus chapter one, you're supposed to sacrifice one bull without blemish, just one bull. And if you don't have bulls, a sheep or a goat, okay? And if you don't even have that, you can give a bird, eh? a dove or a, tut you know, a turtle dove. So that was really the prescription. But Solomon did something so outrageous. What did he sacrifice? 1,000. 1,000 bulls, yet it's only one that was required, okay? And that moved God to an extent that that night, God came and said, what can I give you? Why do you think he did that? God knew that whatever I give this guy, is holding them loosely. He's ready to let go. So I can trust him with stuff. And you read about Solomon, even an African lady went and she was given stuff, right? The queen of Sheba, she was given. Now, have you ever asked for the wisdom of Solomon? Have you ever prayed, God give me wisdom, the wisdom of Solomon? And my question is, with how many bulls? How many bulls were on offer? Why do you go to verse five without thinking of verse four? Yeah, because God did see the heart and say, this is a real steward. When I give him things, the things will not hold him. The things will just disappear, okay? Uh, well, not disappear. The things will be channeled the, in the right way. Ah, thank you, thank you. You need to come to the pre and post marital classes if you want to enjoy these services, right? <laughs> yeah. Hi mambo ya kupatana tu msituni na kuchomoka. Utakiona. Thank you. Okay. So King Solomon, wisdom and no, and everything. There was a trigger. Don't miss the trigger. The next time you pray for the wisdom of Solomon, Remember, what is this that is making God to visit you, okay? What is this that is making? Another story is the story of Tabitha, okay? Um, Tabitha, Acts chapter nine. Acts chapter nine, Tabitha also called Dorcas. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha who was always occupied with the works of kindness and charity. At that time, however, she became sick and died and her body was washed and placed in an upper room. That's verse 30. 37 verse 38 said Lida was near Joppa so when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lida they sent two men to him and asked, <clears throat> and asked him please come at once okay and then verse 39 also all the widows stood around him weeping and and showing him the tunics and other clothing that Dorcas had made when she was still with them now I'm sure in this season of Tabitha's death and sickness, she was not the only candidate for death. There must have been people dying everywhere. You know how many people die in Kenya every day? Okay, at least in China, <laughs> they bury 40 million people every year. And that's why there are no graves for them because those would occupy tons and tons of, of, of land. Now, <clears throat> what was Tabitha or Dorcas known for? She was occupied with works of kindness and charity. Now, do you remember, it's not the widows who, who sent for Peter, actually. It was the disciples. It was the pastors who knew there was a senior apostle around town, and it's like, oh boy, she has died. Don't you think they had benefited from her? That's why, you know, sometimes I think, when you minister to the pastors, I know they pray for everybody, but your prayers, they will pray for you even more. Do you think so? And it's not favoritism, it's just natural. It's just natural, okay? So Tabitha's acts of kindness triggered her resurrection. I know some of us, if we died, some people will come just to make sure you're really gone. What a noise. <laughs> Here there was an outcry because her acts, because her acts. The other person is a man called Cornelius. I'm sure you all know the story of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. Cornelius is reported to have been, he and his, all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those he need and prayed to God regularly. One day, about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius, Cornelius stared at him with in fear and said, what is it, Lord? He asked. The angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before 
God. Cornelius, of course, you know, was not a Jew. <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 but there was something that he did that became a memorial that came up to heaven as something that was going to be remembered. We were told he was devout, God-fearing. So your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering. And you know the way Peter then, you know, was sent and one of the things Cornelius received was the Holy Spirit as a result of this encounter. His gifts and his offerings were speaking on his behalf somewhere else. There was a memory, there was a, a flash disk, okay, let's call it a flash disk or, or a hard disk. And, and uh, you know, when, you are, when computers came, there were floppy disks, right? You remember the floppy disks? Those of you who are nearing expiry, there was a floppy disk, <laughs> including me. Uh, <laughs> very small memories. So I'm sure, you know, when you go to heaven, there is, there is a memory. <laughs> There's something that triggers you to be remembered. And what is being remembered, it, well, uh, it, it's not your fasting and prayer has been remembered, though it's important. It is your arms and your giving that have come up as a memorial. Again, when you pray, do you pray, God, remember me? Do you normally pray that prayer? Remember me, remember the children, remember, remember, remember. You know, you cannot remember an empty flash disk. There has to be something that was put in. <laughs> you cannot put a flash disk and search for a file. So there's got to be a file to be searched. And that file has to be big enough that when <laughs> five billion people are asking for remembrance, something pops up, okay, in the screen of the throne. So Cornelius' giving became a, we are not even asked that he has to be remembered. Just the, the, his giving just spoke for him, spoke for him, and he probably didn't have to do 21 days of fasting, you know, as much as he might have done, but there was a, a giving that was a memorial. So question, what is in the throne up there? What is this that you are being remembered for? That God can come down and say, I have remembered you. There is a memorial because of what you are doing. Of course, we know the forms of giving, tithes, offering, fast fruits, and alms. I wanted to talk slightly about tithing because I know it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a contentious issue in the body of, of, of Christ. Um, of course, tithe means 10%, right? Tithe means 10% in Hebrew, period, okay? Some people say it was a legal requirement and we are no longer other, under the law. <clears throat> but if you look closely, if you study closely, the institutionalization of tithing happened before the Levitical order of priesthood. Remember, Abraham paid a tithe to a man called Melchizedek in Genesis 14. If you read that story, um, you know, he blessed Abraham and Abraham gave a tenth of everything. Now, the writer of Hebrews delves very deeply into the issues of priesthood, and I encourage you to read. It's a bit technical. Uh, it's, a, it's a little technical book, but very interesting regarding priesthood. But what we know in summary is that Jesus is a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So there is the Levitical priesthood that received the tithes prescribed by the law, but then there is the Melchizedek priesthood of which Jesus is in that order that also received the tithes. So tithing, whether it's Levitical or Melchizedek priesthood, is applicable. And since we are subscribers to the priesthood of Jesus Christ, tithing is a practice that is expected of us, okay? And uh, why is tithing important? I know, I know you have, you know, again, this as an interesting scripture that has been read to us time and again. In tithing, we make God a priority. In tithing, it's a means of proving God. This is probably the only scripture that God says, try me, test me in this way. And I know a lot of questions, you know, whether you know, you really tithe or not, should I tithe um, net, gross, whatever it is. And I think the answer is, try it. If it works, continue. If it doesn't, abandon, <laughs> okay? Try it, and, and this is God's invitation. Test me in this way. How does God provide for us? By opening the floodgates. As a means of provision by God. Open the floodgates of heaven. And also a means of participating in God's word. God says, in, in God's work, God says that there might be food in my house. So I know a lot of people struggling with tithing. But to the extent that 
We want to prove God faithful. We want to get provision from God. We want to participate in God's work. It is important that we also excel in this grace of tithing. There's also a serious question about where is my storehouse? Some people, you know, say, you know, I tithe to uh, TD Jakes in Dallas, Texas, and I come to Sita Meldoret for services, okay? Or I tithe to some serious people you, 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 you listen to, and uh, um, one of the risks of some of those external people is one time stories come out and say the person you are tithing, you, tithing to is actually a pedophile. He's being, he's doing child trafficking. Uh, but since they do very good marketing on this, on the, on, on, on the um, media, you might imagine that that's the right place. But look at Galatians 6, 6. First of all, the Mal Malachi says, bring your gifts to the storehouse, tithes and offerings to the storehouse. Okay. And thinking about the concept of the storehouse, Galatians 6, 6, those who are taught the word of God should provide for their teachers, sharing all good things with them. If you are taught the word of God from here, then your provision should be here, isn't it? It's not like somebody is listening for you the other side and the money going the other side. First Corinthians 9, 13, don't you know that those who serve in the temple get their food from the temple and that those who serve in the altar share in what is offered on the altar? In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should be supported by those who accept it. Every time that there is a word coming out from this pulpit and you're accepting this word, you know, your tithes and offerings come to support the work that's happening here. And so it's generally agreed that tithes and offerings should come to your local assembly, the place that you get your spiritual nourishment day by day, okay? And then the rest of givings and offerings and the rest, I know some of us who come from the villages out there know how they struggle and we support them, you know? I, when I go to my village, I'm known as a board member of the church and they count their offerings, it's 5,000 a month and the pastor has to be paid and you know, somebody has to be paid and the rest. And, and sometimes we support that as, an, as, a, as a giving, as a gift, not from our tithes and offerings, because the anointing, the grace over this place, we partake of the grace when our resources come to this place. Because where your heart is, <laughs> where your treasure is, yes, your, where your treasure is, that is where your heart will be. So tithes and offerings, of course, offerings are free will. You know, these are now the extras. You know, when you pay your tithes, you are not being generous. You are being obedient. Okay, when you pay your tithe, you're being, when you pay KRA your, the, the, the amount, 30% or whatever it is with holding taxes, are you generous to the government? Yeah, you just want to avoid jail, most likely. <laughs> Otherwise, if the government was giving you your salary and saying, count 30% and go to Kip Tagich house and give at the counter, I don't know how many of us would do that. They know they have to take it at source, first of all. Okay, yes. So tithing is an issue of obedience. And offerings, again, is this thing now that speaks out there? Is this thing that makes God to visit Solomon beyond that which is, is, is prescribed? Beyond that which is prescribed? Great. What are some of the rewards of generosity? Um, again, I see our time is up. We'll conclude shortly. Giving multiplies. Matthew 6.38, what says, give and it will come back to you. Now, what is this it? Sometimes we think it will come back to you in terms of money. Consider the story of uh, the widow of Zarephath. You remember the widow of Zarephath in 1 Kings chapter 17? You know, Elijah comes and she says, give me bread. And it's like, you know, the oil and the flour I have is only for us to eat once and for all. And she anyway goes ahead to make the bread. And what, does, what happens to her? It is written that the, flour, the bean of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry. For the widow of Zarephath, the it was the flour. The it was the oil. It never ended. Remember the story of Anna in 1 Samuel, Anna crying for a child and telling God, if you give me a child, I'll give him back to you. He's given Samuel. How many children did she have after Samuel? Five. Yes, give Samuel and it will come back to you as five children. When the boy in John 6 surrendered two loaves, two fish and five loaves, it was two fish and five loaves, what was collected 
was a remnant of what was surrendered. It was fish and love. There wasn't like you gave fish, multiplied, and it became ugali and oranges. No, it became like the same, same thing that was given is the thing that was multiplied. And they actually filled 12 baskets with fragments of the five loaves. I actually realized that they ate all the fish. Just like when, when there is a lot of food and there is ugali and nyama, do you normally collect leftover nyama? Nima ugali tu zinabaki. Or, or fish. That was, a, <laughs> that was happening even those days, okay? So the thing that you give will come back to you. The treasures, the time, the, 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 your talents as you give, it, come back, it, it comes back to you. You know, sometimes, you know, there are weddings. I think our brother Alex, 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 where is Alex Mwangi? Alex, we saw the wedding uh, announcement here, the second time of asking, right? So te- it should also be your second time of asking, can I bring a balloon to this wedding? Oh, what can, I, what can I buy? So that you invest in somebody's wedding, people will come for your wedding, isn't you? It's not like, uh, and, I, and I've heard people say, Sitam does not support weddings. No, 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 what, what is Sitam? Is it this building? What you invest, you get back. If you want to be visited, visit. If you want people to contribute in your WhatsApp group, contribute in others. It's a biblical principle. Give and it will come back to you. If you don't have time for people, people will not have time for you. Give time, it comes back to you. Give your treasures. Wonderful singing here. They are giving their treasures. You think that is for free. Those guys will be rewarded. But congratulations, because they are giving their time. I checked in here yesterday and they were singing very hard and you were sleeping. And you're expecting the same reward? No way. <laughs> God will rebuke the devourer on your behalf. Of course, there are many forms of devourers. In this agricultural setting, people were farmers and they were, they were, they were um, you know, planting. So the locusts, all these things that come, the canker worms, God was saying he will rebuke. We have many devourers these days here. Uh, you know, it could be the economy that devours. Fuel, all this, you know, the world economy <laughs> is changing. But the kingdom economy is not affected. And it is God to rebuke the devourer in your business, the devourer in your family, the devourer in your whatever thing you get to do. And we have talked about God remembering. And this is a new one that I really had not studied it. Number four, your children will be blessed. Psalm 37, 26, the godly are always generous and lend freely, their children will be blessed. Another other version say, their children will be a blessing. Other, another version says, their children will turn out good. Their children will turn out good. The godly, who is generous, their children will turn out good. I look at many of the adults here. Somehow you have turned out good, right? You didn't. Uh... <laughs> Why? Maybe your parents were very good and generous people. And I think there was a generation of parents who are extremely generous. You know, with their food. You go home, there's nothing, and they are still feeding neighbors, okay? You take food home, like, you know, this will last you the whole year. And then unakuta wanapeana. Have you experienced that? And then you keep giving out. Do you know why? The wealth of the right of the righteous. The wealth of the wicked will be gathered for the righteous. So continue giving so that the righteous can distribute to other people. <laughs> anyway, that, that, that's a joke. When we think about bringing up children, we take them to good schools, right? We give them, we pray for them, bring them up in the way of God. But it seems there's another addition. When you are generous, your children will prosper. Your children will be a blessing. You know, it's possible that the children can be a cause of pain. And your teaching and everything is great. But your giving also goes as a memorial that makes your children to to succeed, to be a blessing to you and to turn out good. So it's t- time to go back to that generosity. And I think one of the ways that this happens is because you, the children learn, of course, as you bring your maize and great generosity, those of you that gave 100 bags of maize, don't, don't you think God will bless them? Is it even a, an issue? God will definitely bless them. And if you're bringing with your children, the children will learn and then accrue the benefits in, of their own generosity. But also the cover that God gives to you and your children on the account of your generosity is going to make them be a blessing. 
Giving is stored up in heaven as a treasure. Your labor is, is, is blessed. Your influence increases. Your influence increases. If you, if you, recently Bill Gates was in town, right? I think he was in Kenya. And he made a statement about GMO food. Whether you believe GMO or not, depending on whatever standpoint. And I think he said, I eat GMO every day. And, and that was quoted. I'm sure all of you have spoken about GMO, right? Has anybody quoted you anywhere <laughs> that can be said? It's about the influence. Your influence expands, and when you speak, it is hard. And you know, Bill Gates has influence not because of Microsoft and the computers. It's because of the Bill Gates Foundation. He gives out a lot of money to charity. In Kenya, do you know your malaria and TB and HIV medicines? Bill Gates is there. Even if you don't like Bill Gates, because some people say conspiracy theories, you know, whatever it is, and then you go to the shop and get a, 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 a malaria medicine that has been subsidized by Bill Gates. Who is cleverer now? <laughs> anyway, your influence increases when you are a giver. In conclusion, God is our ultimate source. We are only stewards. Giving is after God's nature. Generosity is not about what is in your pocket. Remember, the accolades that Solomon receives is the same accolades that the widow that gave a coin in the temple received. Because what is a factor of the heart? Didn't we read that a gift is expect, accepted according to what one has, not according to what does not have? And you will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. God is looking out for people whose hearts are generous so that they can be a channel. But if God sees a cool de sac, he's going to withhold it and keep giving to the people that are a source of a blessing. And so, as we, the, 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 so giving is a currency of the kingdom economics. The kingdom economics does not depend on the war between Ukraine and the other fellow. Uh, it does not depend on the drought and the rest because he's the ultimate source. And so to be found in that system requires that our hearts are hearts of giving, knowing that we are stewards. So as we go into the year, thank God there is an opportunity to give a thanksgiving offering. As you go into next year and make your resolutions, maybe one of the resolutions should be, what should be your resolution about giving this coming year? Maybe you would like God to help you to be a good tither going forward. But remember, as the Macedonian churches, they started by giving themselves to the Lord first, okay? And that's what we need to do. We give ourselves to the Lord and we embrace the spirit of generosity because it's the spirit of God. And God bless you. Amen. Amen.